Thank you very much. It's lovely to be with you here uh, this Sunday evening to share on the subject of revival. Uh, we really appreciate the invitation to be here, and we trust that God will bless our hearts and speak to us uh, while we look at his word. We're going to uh, read together a few verses from Second Chronicles and chapter 7. Now, for those who have heard messages on revival in the past, this will be a familiar passage of Scripture. For others, perhaps not. Second Chronicles and chapter 7. And we're going to commence, please, at verse 11. The background to this passage is that the great temple in Jerusalem had been built by Solomon. And that temple had been dedicated to God. And when it was dedicated, the presence and the power of God descended into the temple to such an extent that the people, the priests, were unable to minister. And God had put his stamp on the temple being the place where he would meet with his people. And his glory was in the midst. So that was a wonderful experience for the Jewish people at that time, and for Solomon, when he had finished praying, the glory filled the house. So we're going to break in just subsequent to this event happening, how God speaks to Solomon, and we're breaking in at verse 11, Second Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 11. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house. And all that came into Solomon's heart to make in the house of the Lord and in his own house, he prosperously effected. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Amen. And we know God will bless the public reading of his word. Now, I want us to do what we did last week, and that is for a few moments before I pray, I want you to pray. So often we're busy and this and that, that we don't get time to talk to God before we come to a gathering. And I would like you to bow your heart with me, and I'd like you to ask God to speak to you, to be receptive, to open your heart to him, to open your mind to him and to his word. So if you consciously choose to ask God to speak to you, I believe God will hear your prayer because he wants to speak to you. So for a few moments, we'll be silent. And in those moments, you ask God to work in your life and bring yourself to him, and then we'll pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to meet together around your word. We thank you for the help of the Holy Spirit already in the gathering. We pray, Lord, for the anointing and grace of the Holy Spirit to be poured upon us. Lord, without thee, we can do nothing. So we ask, Lord, at this point, that you would put a hedge around about us, that your glory, your presence and power, that we would sense that descending into our midst. Please unstop our ears. Please touch our hearts. Lord, draw us after yourself and prepare our hearts 
for the plan and purpose that you have for your people. I pray, Lord, for that gracious anointing, that oil that your word says that there was none like it. I pray for that rich anointing of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Tonight, uh, the subject is the when of revival. The when of revival. When does revival come? When does it occur? In the passage that we read together, it's a time in Solomon's life of immense blessing. He has built the temple. He has built his own home. The kingdom is extending. God's hand is upon him. It seems hard to believe when we read later on in the life of Solomon that he got so far from God. It seems strange to believe that you could be so close to God and hearing God and God coming to you at nighttime and speaking to you and yet later on to lose touch with God altogether. That's a warning to all of us who are Christians, regardless of where we are in our spiritual life. Unless we maintain our obedience and walk with God, we can lose it and we can lose or lose our way. Well, God obviously is aware of this. And so God puts a warning or a shot over the bow to Solomon. Although it's a night of great blessing, the temple has been dedicated, and Solomon has uh, been in his room, his home, wherever he is, and God appears to him. I don't know what form that takes, but it's very clear that God appears and Solomon knows that God is speaking to him. And what God says to him is this, If I shut up heaven... God points out that there are times whenever he will withdraw his blessing. We should be aware of that both individually as Christians and also as churches and indeed as a nation, that there are times when God withholds and lifts his blessing. It's interesting that the consequences of sin are here alluded to by God. The consequences of sin are always negative. There is nothing good that comes from sin. I want you to notice that in today's society, we every time we put the news on, everybody's talking about global warming. They're talking about the environment. They're talking about saving the planet. And while there perhaps is an element of truth to what's been said, I really don't have the answer to that. But even if there is an element of truth to it, The one issue that the Bible talks about, and which certainly television and media will not mention, is that God does speak about environmental problems. God does speak about problems with the land, problems with drought, problems with starvation. They're mentioned right through the Bible, but they are not related to gas. They are not related to coal or fossil energy. They are always related to sin. To sin. And here God says that if I shut up that there be no rain, that is a drought that God is speaking about. God says I will bring droughts. He then says not only will droughts come, but he said if I send or I command my locusts, The armies of God, the locusts. Well, when a drought comes, that stops growth. When locusts come, they devour the growth. In other words, God says one way or the other, I'll bring a real deadness, dryness to the land. God seems to add to the mixture as if that weren't enough. He said, if there's, uh, if I close up heaven, there's no rain. And then he said, I send the locust, devour the land. Then he said, or if I send pestilence, it seems that God has plenty of tools at his hand. God will punish sin. He will punish sin. I remember several years ago, uh, we had the privilege of a, an international missionary who 
traveled around the world, and he has gone to many churches and many regions where there have been revivals. He pointed out to us when he came to speak to us in Lisburn that when he decided one evening to take the map of the world and to put pins on the maps for all the revivals that he was aware of, either locally in churches or even nationally, he decided to take pins and put them in the maps. And what he discovered was that there was, I think, one pin in America, and there were no pins in Europe. They were all in Asia, Africa, South America, and in the Muslim countries. That's where the pins were. It seems that Europe and the former Reformed nations, the Protestant nations of the earth, that 500 years ago were given the light of the gospel, those nations now are certainly under the judgment of God. There's many reasons for that, but there's no doubt. Whether it be America, whether it be Canada, whether it be Britain, or Germany, or other uh, uh, North Northern Europe countries, Norway and so on, these countries are not only far from God, but they're, they're very much promoting everything that is immoral, ungodly, and wicked. And so God says, I can send my droughts, my devourers, or my plagues. Alistair Petrie told us a story, and I'm going to commence with this story, and then I'm going to finish the story, just in case you think that I have forgotten it. I haven't. I'll tell you the uh, remainder of it at the end. He told us about a, a region in South America. They were particularly wicked in this area. They had lived very wicked lives. There was murder and stealing and thieving and adultery, and uh, there were uh, rapes and so on. It, it was a terrible place, very evil. But he said this continued for generations, and eventually something happened in that region. Eventually, the land, which had been productive, began to get less and less productive. The vegetables wouldn't grow as large, and everything was declining. Then, he said, the animals, the very animals began to leave. They wouldn't stay. The very fish left the seas, and they couldn't, they couldn't get fish anymore. It was, it was as though God's judgment were upon the people. In the Isle of Lewis, uh, where my wife is from, in the Isle of Lewis, those who I'm sure have heard or read up on that awakening in 1949 to 53, the young people had started to leave the place of worship. They started to uh, no longer visit or go to church. And so what happened was that there were certain clergymen in the island of Lewis began to get concerned because they could see that if the youth had no interest in the house of God, then that was judgment was coming for the island. And so what they did, the presbytery met in, in the Stornoway and they, they prayed and they met together and they said, we, we must collectively put out a, a document to all our congregations to be read and really, the core of the message was that it was obvious that the island was under divine displeasure. Because the means of grace, as they call it up there, was no longer being utilized. People weren't praying anymore. And the people were departing from God, and they were, they were going for the secular, the places of amusement were filled, and the house of God was empty. It could have been said like the Old Testament whenever the daughter-in-law of Eli was dying at the birth of her child and she said, call him Ichabod. The glory has departed. In the book of Lamentations, poor Jeremiah who has endured the destruction of the town and city, the region that he loved so much in Judah, in the book of Lamentations, he cries out this cry that one could only comprehend and grasp if you studied the book of Jeremiah and you studied the book of Lamentations. It, it comes across so powerfully from this man who's broken over the sin of the people of God, and he cries out, the crown is fallen from our head. 
Well, friends, the crown has fallen from our hen. Samson, wonderfully used by God, anointed by the Holy Spirit, whenever Delilah had deceived him and cut his hair, she said that the Philistines be upon thee, and he jumped up and he said, I will shake myself as at other times, he said, and I will defeat them. But he wist not that the Spirit of the Lord had departed from him. He didn't even know. My friends, it's bad enough in our land when the Spirit of the Lord has departed, when the glory is taken. What's even worse is when people don't even know it. And that's the tragedy right across the evangelical church tonight. There may be some exceptions, but generally that's it. The glory is departed, but the people don't realize that God is absent. They, they don't realize that the presence of God and the favor of God is not upon us. Because they assume that the meetings are going on and the preaching is orthodox and it's either evangelical or biblical, they assume God's blessing is on it. I remember many years ago when we had got married, my wife and I, we were living in Achali, and with the privilege of Colin and Mary Peckham, Mary was saved in the Lewis revival. She had witnessed revival, experienced revival several times in her life. She was invited to a church in Lisbon to have a morning service. I can so remember when she came home, came to our home, and was about to sit down for dinner, and her husband said to her, Well, Mary, how did you get on this morning in the church? She said, I was in a morgue this morning. An evangelical morgue. I was in a morgue this morning. My friends, the consequences of sin, God warns Solomon about. And we must be aware that there are times that God's glory, his presence, his power, his favor, his anointing are withdrawn. God said to Hosea, I will go to my place talking about the glory of God. Now the glory, in case you don't understand what that means, it means the imprint of God's presence. If I put my foot in, in uh, snow, I will leave an imprint. That will be the glory. That's the evidence of me being present. When the glory comes, that's the imprint of God, that everybody knows God is here. The glory. And God slowly withdrew the glory, and then he said to Hosea, I will go to my place until they acknowledge their sin. My friends, in the text, we have not only read, first of all, the consequences of sin mentioned in verse 13, but then we have also the conditions for revival. God then states, if my people which are called by my name. I want you to notice that revival does not commence with the unconverted. It does not commence with people who do not know the Lord. It is not for the uh, drunkard. It is not for the man full of lust. It is not for the liar or the cheat. It is not for the one who batters his wife or she batters her husband. It is not for that person. It is not even for the religious person, the churchgoer, even the clergyman who's not converted. Revival is really the consequences of revival may affect them, but they have no input whatever regarding revival because they are enemies of God through sin. They are still children of the devil, needing God's salvation and redemption. So God points out to Solomon, he said, if my people, my people, God is pointing out there is a mark of ownership on people in the earth. And it is still the same tonight, my friend, around this globe of 8 billion people. There are millions upon millions, and they are owned by God. God's mark is upon them. And God does mark his people. We read of the 
prophet in the Old Testament, when God said to him, he said, set a mark upon the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that are done in Israel. Oh, yes, my friend, God has his eye on every soul, and he knows those who belong to him, and he knows those who don't. And so he said, it's my people. But then he points out my people who are called by my name. What does that mean? Well, it is really to enforce the same point. It it basically means those who bear my name, those who carry my name. When my three children were born, on each occasion, either if I was there or wasn't there or came in later, whatever it might have been, there would have been a little tag put on their hand. And you had a certain number of days or hours for to get their name. And each one, whenever they were coming home, there was a little tag and there was always Bartley on the end of it. They had my name. They belonged to me. They're mine. God is stating the same point. He said, they, if my people which are called or bear my name or those who belong to me. So, if tonight you belong to God, this message is for you. Not for the person beside you. Not for the other church down the road. My friend, this is for you as it is for me. If my people, I qualify. If I'm a child of God. Now let me point out, if God sets this for all his people, then that means that every one of his people are culpable and also capable of fulfilling these requirements that God has stated. God never commands us to do something that he does not give his grace to perform. You say that what you're presenting tonight, Alan, in in a land that's broken, as our young people are committing suicide, as their lives are broken, as they're drug addicts, as they're going down the route of transgender homosexuality. My dear friends, these are all the consequences of sin. And these dear people need the love of God. They need the mercy of Jesus Christ. They need salvation just the same way as you and I did. They're just as lost as what we were. But we have found the answer in Jesus Christ. And God wants us to present the gospel in such a manner in our lives and by the message that they can be one to Christ and can be healed and helped and delivered and set free. And whenever demonic presences are in their lives, driving them in these directions, these demonic powers can be broken, just as the man of Gadara was delivered by the Lord. So there are people all across our land tonight. They're in our families tonight. They're in our homes tonight. And they need delivered. And the Lord Jesus Christ is still the deliverer. He's still the one that sets them free. And he can do it, whatever their issue is, because he's strong and he's mighty to save. Well, those that bear his name, the Lord said that's who this is addressed to. But what is presented is the great if. This is what God says. God knowing the heart of man, writing through and to Solomon. He doesn't say, when my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves. God knows that there's a real possibility because his people have a sinful nature that they might never do this. God knows that they may never follow him. He makes that great risk, as it were, in permitting us to have choices. And God says, if my people, if my people. Oh, what an if over our lives. My dear friend, which side of if will you turn to? Will you be one of those who say, Lord, I will follow you. I will obey you. Or will you follow the old man, the self-nature, and say, I will have my own way. I will do it in my own strength. My dear friends, the love of God has been experienced in your heart. He has given his son for you, and he so longs that you would give all to him. I don't know if you heard the story of the little black girl who during the time 
of the slavery. She was being sold on a block. Two men were bidding for her. A gentleman was standing watching. He was a Christian. He knew by the intent of the two men bidding that they had no good for this young girl as they bid to sell her or buy her just like a piece of meat. As they were coming toward the end of the bidding and one was going to win, he suddenly put up the price. He put the price so high that neither of them could bid. He walked over to the man who was holding the girl, give him the money, and he said, take the young girl and break the chains off her hands and feet and set her free. He broke off the chains and said to the girl, you're free. She started to walk away and then she wondered, where do I go to? Why am I free? I've never been free. And as she thought for a while, she turned round and she saw the man who had bought her the man who had set her free, she saw him walking into the distance. And she ran after him and she said, let me follow you. Let me be your slave. My friends, that's what Jesus has done for you. He paid the price in full. He broke the chains off. You can be free. Should your heart of love not say, I want to follow him? I want to give everything to him. No one has treated me like him. Well, God says, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves. Now, many people have a deep misunderstanding of this humility. I have met people who said, oh, it means you've got to become a doormat and let people tramp all over you. Well, that's not my uh, understanding of humility. It's more stupidity than humility, but some people go down that route. What is humility in the Bible? Well, if we want to find an accurate example of humility, we go to Philippians 2. Now, I'm not going to turn to that. I'm going to quote to you. Philippians 2 is the story of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven. And the Bible says of Jesus that he humbled himself. And he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and earth and underneath the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus humbled himself. What did he do? He submitted every area of his life to God the Father. He did nothing other than what the Father told him. While he was on earth, he laid aside his glory and he chose to follow the will of God implicitly and he was empowered by the Holy Spirit to do that. In like manner, he says to you and I, will you submit to the Father? Will you present yourselves to God and lay aside your own will, your own ambitions, your own dreams, what you want to do? Will you give yourself to God and obey him? A missionary many years ago, her name leaves my mind, but I'll tell you the story. She decided and felt led by God. She had become a Christian and she wanted to be a missionary. Her father had said to her, you couldn't be a missionary. All you can do is talk. And she said, well, I'll talk for Jesus. But she so wanted to follow the Lord. She so wanted to follow him. And one day as a maid in a large home where she worked, she had saved up all her savings, taken everything she had and put it in front of her bed and laid down a little bit of money on the bed. She set her Bible on the bed, and she knelt beside the bed. And she said, Lord, take me. This is all I have. And use me to win others. God heard her cry. She became a great, a great missionary in Africa. My dear friend, God wants us to humble ourselves. To humble ourselves. You see... What I want to point out to you briefly is that this humility precedes prayer. The, 
the Lord doesn't say pray and humble yourself. He says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and then pray. Now, there's a reason for that. Because prayer without humility is not effective prayer. There are many Christians, my friend, they come to prayer meetings, they have not humbled themselves, and their prayers are ineffective. Many Christians don't even bother, at least they've been honest enough to acknowledge, I don't pray anyway, so I'll not bother going to the prayer meeting because I don't have a prayer life. At least they're a bit on more honest. You see, my friends, if there's not prayer in your life, then you're not breathing. You're not breathing. It means you're sick, dying. And you could be dressed correctly and carrying the right Bible, and you could be doing all that the clergy tell you, and you could be an elder, deacon, even a pastor, but you're dying. You're dying on your feet. Because God says you must humble yourself and pray. The opposite of pride. One of the most detestable things to see in a person, especially a clergyman, pride. A know-all, knows everything. Humility is a wonderful character. It's a wonderful and a beautiful fruit of the Spirit. Well, God says you must humble yourself. You say, what would that mean for me, Alan, practically? Well, in the Old Testament, in the book of Jeremiah, God sent Jeremiah to the potter's house, and the clay was there. You're a piece of clay in the hand of the Lord. You get saved, you're a piece of clay. But you see, if you're resistant, if you're proud, if you want your own way, then God has to kind of keep you in the potter's house, but you're kind of sitting to the side kind of sitting to the side, because there's not much you can do with clay that's hard and resistant. God knows that. And so God tries to keep working with you, but you're not, up, you're not cooperating, so you have to keep staying to the side. While God is making other vessels, you have to stay to the side. But if you come to a place where you say, God, I'm making a complete mess of this Christian life, and I desperately need you to intervene, Lord. I don't know, I don't understand all that's involved, but Lord, I really want to follow you. And whatever it takes, Lord, you might have to turn me inside out and upside down. I'm for that. I really want, Lord, to, to grow. I want, I want to become like you. I want to have the Spirit of God flowing through me. Lord, that's what I want. Well, then what happens is God will take you. It mightn't be a great dramatic experience in your life, but God will take you. And God will take you from the shelf, as it were, and he'll put you onto the potter's wheel. And what he'll do is he'll start to pour water on and he'll start to work and it'll not be nice. It'll not be nice. People think when they give everything to God, they humble themselves before God, that it's all going to be, you know, uh, all, all, all flowers and roses and, uh, and wee buns. It's not going to be that. My friend, he has to begin to make a vessel. You see, as you are, the vessel's not made yet. You're too resistant. You've got your own way. God blesses you, but nothing to the way he wants to. He can't do with you what he wants to do with you. Your will is too strong. Those areas of your life are, are so settled after decades. And God can't get his thumb in there. But what God wants is God, you to say to God, God, I don't care what you do. Lord, I have opinions, I have prejudices, I have ideas in my life. I'm open, Lord, that you would do your will in my life. And what he'll do, my friend, he'll put his hands inside you and he'll begin to shape. And if you give him time and you walk with him, he'll keep the water flowing on. He'll keep his spirit coming upon you. And it'll not be easy, but, but he'll start to form a vessel. And you'll begin to realize God's doing something in my life you'll begin to realize I have an unseen hand on my life and you'll know it. You'll know it's not yourself. You'll know it's not your ability. You'll know it's not your skill. You'll know it's an unseen hand and it's the hand of the master. For he'll show up in your life. He says, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and then pray. You see, friends, what we have to understand 
is that God doesn't hear all prayer. That might be a shock for some of you. God doesn't hear all prayer. People say, oh, well, I pray to God, and this woman's a great prayer. I hear people say, no, 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 my friend, you haven't read your Bible. God does not hear all prayer. Now, I could give you a sermon on that tonight. I'll not, but I want to give you a few verses from the Bible, okay? In the book of Isaiah, in chapter 1, I think it's around 15, 16, the people are coming to God like this. People of God. And they're coming and they're praying, and God responds to them, and God says, you can lift up your hands, but he says, I'm not hearing you. I'm not hearing your prayers. God says that. I'm not hearing them. Why? Why are you not hearing God? <laughs> because your hands are full of blood. You've shed blood. I don't know if I mentioned this before in the meeting, but I found it... Sad, but almost amusing, but sad. Recently, whenever the tragedy took place in Donegal, the bomb and the 11, 12 people were sadly killed. And some of our politicians uh, put a, came on, they were on the news and all, and they were praying. They were pr praying for the people of Kreshlov, I think it is. And I just happened to be reading Isaiah 1 that day. And I'll not name them, but... <laughs> They were on both sides, by the way. They were both green and orange, the two of them. And I remember thinking, well, your prayers are not worth a spittle. It's your nice, your wee talk's nice, your wee text and all. But I want to tell you, God will not hear you. I know God will not hear you. Why? Because there's blood in your hands. You agree with abortion. You have fought vehemently to get mothers to kill their children, to get doctors to kill children. My friends, abortion's murder. It's murder. You say, well, how can you be? Because the Bible makes it very clear. And in the ministry that I have been involved in for 25 years, I have prayed with many mothers, many mothers, who have regretted later on, become Christians, regretted committing abortions. And every time there's demons in those mothers, the demon of death and the demon of Moloch is always there in the mother. You can't kill a child and get away with it. My friend, there's a price to be paid. For sin. God can forgive. Thank God he does. He forgives mothers. And I sat with them as they wept and wept and wept. As God revealed to them and showed them the little child in heaven. The little child goes to heaven. But it never had the right to live. It could have become a dentist, a doctor. It, had all, it could have had all those things. And it was wrenched away from the womb. And that little child goes to heaven. Never was allowed to live on earth. My friends, it's terrible. Well, let's get back to the subject. Pray. Pray. The Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If I have sin in my life that I'm not repenting of, God says I'll not hear you. People say, well, what do you mean God will not hear me? My friends, never mind God answering. People say about God answering prayer. He says, I don't even hear it. God closes down prayer. There's people praying. God says, no. No, your heart's not right. No, I'm not taking that. That's not coming to me. It's not even getting to my ear. That's what God says. The Bible says, He that turneth away his ear from hearing the word of God, his prayer shall be an abomination to God. That's what the Bible says. See, I'm not interested in the word of God. I don't care what the Bible has to say, but I just pray to God. Well, God says, if you turn away your ear from hearing this book, God says, your prayer is an abomination to me. You see, my dear friends, it says, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, and then we have prayer defined. We have the prerequisite to prayer, humility. Then we have the beginnings of true prayer, and then it's defined. Prayer's defined. What is prayer? What is this prayer that's going to really turn a God, as it were, get the heart of God and get the grip of God? Well, he says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. It's defined in seeking the face of God. My prayer is not for me. It's not something for me. So many people, prayer is nothing more than a Tesco list. Lord, do this, solve that, 
uh, do you? Now, my friend, that, that has a place in prayer, but it's not the heart of prayer. The heart of prayer is me coming and wanting the face. That means the smile of God. For many years as a Christian, I have to confess, I went in to pray. I found it the most boring, the most ineffective, the most unrewarding experience of the Christian life. I enjoyed going to meetings. I enjoyed hearing preaching. I enjoyed gospel music. I enjoyed church activity. I enjoyed all that. I even tolerated the church prayer meeting. But private prayer, oh, it was kind of like evangelical purgatory. You just had to go through it, you know. And eventually, after time, it dawned through light coming from God and the prayer life of others and listening to Christians in the deeper Christian life, and I, be I began to dawn, there's something wrong with me. I'm saved, but there's something wrong. And what I discovered was there was much sin in my life as a Christian. I was full of myself. I wanted to do everything my own way. I, I had all the rules laid down as to how I would live the Christian life. And I laid out what I wanted to do with my life. And then I said, God, you bless what I'm going to do. Instead of coming to God and saying, God, I have no plan at all. Your plan. I yield to your plan. I had never prayed like that. I was afraid to pray like that. That would mean God would take me God knows where. God would be, it, it's being radical as a Christian. And I wasn't in for being radical. But I got tired of the death. I got tired of the prayerlessness. I got tired of the, uh, uh, the lack of hunger for God and the lack of reality of God and the sin in my life. And so there came a day whenever I said to God, just as I preached tonight, I said, God, I'm letting go. I give you my life. I give you my future. I give you everything. I let it go. I'm giving it. Lord, take it. Take me. Do whatever you want. Do a miracle through my life. And I did it, and I meant it. And friends, certain things happened, but one of the most dramatic things that happened was that I began to pray. And I began to love prayer. I began to get burdened over things. I began to... Things that, that I knew weren't from my heart. Things that... I had never dreamed of asking God about, but these things were rising in my heart for others, for, for the nation, for, for, for people, for God's blessing, for his presence, for conversions. And these things, as they rose up, my friends, very often I was in tears, weeping before God. I knew that it wasn't me. It wasn't me. All that had happened was that God the Holy Spirit had been given freedom in my life. The great well within was released. You see, when you're converted, there comes into you, my friends, a great spring. He's called the Holy Spirit. You know what a spring is? It sends out water. I was saying in the prayer meeting the other night about Bill McLeod. He told of Canada that they sent this machine in to dig a spring well in Canada. And they brought the machine in. And they were shocked because when they hit the spring... Suddenly the water went out into the sky and it flooded the villages and they couldn't get the thing stopped. And they brought hundreds and hundreds of, of lorries with concrete and they just kept pouring the concrete into the spring and eventually, eventually they killed the spring. And when you come to Christ, there is a spring. Jesus said, out of your innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the spirit that believe, that believe in him should receive. My friend, the spring is there. But the enemy has poured his concrete in on your soul. And the well is now done. There is no water coming out. It is all theory. It is all from the brain. It is all intellect. It is all knowledge. It is all theory. But in revival, God removes the concrete from the heart. Repentance and yielding to God occurs. And then the spring comes up and life comes with it. And my friend, you pray the way you never thought of praying. You're getting the life of God flowing through you. And you're a channel only. That's what happens. Oh, my friends, this truth was so common years ago in this land. Pulpits up and down the land preached what I'm preaching. 
But people tell me today, I have never heard that before. I never hear that. Because the crown has fallen from her head. Well, my friends, what should I do? I should be spending time with God alone. You see, my friends, praying with God, praying in the secret place, if you're bored, it's because you're on your own, that's why. We're all bored of our own company. We all get bored. But once you let go and let him come in, he'll be there. He'll be there. And you'll be able to sit in silence before him for an hour or two hours and just worship him. He'll be there. On many occasions I've sat in my study and I just sat in silence and worshipped the Lord. I really felt I could touch him. And I didn't get bored, my friends. I didn't get bored because he's there. The master is there. Could it be that all that you're involved in and all that you're doing in the work of God is you simply working for him? Could it be that the master longs, as in Revelation 3 and 20, he says, I stand at your door and I knock. If you open the door, I will come in. Could that be? Every true man and woman of prayer, my friend, loves the presence of God and experiences the presence of God. I encourage you to pray and to take these truths in your heart into a quiet place with God. I encourage you, if your heart is so disposed and moved by God, and that is the desire of your heart tonight, I encourage you to meet with others who have the same desire. To meet with others who have the same desire to pray. Tragically, the church prayer meeting today, it won't really work. Not all of them, but most of them it won't work. Because the person who has the burden, the person who's touched God, when they come into the church prayer meeting, everybody's still sitting on the shelf. They're still living out of the self-life. There's no faith in their prayer. There's no desire. There's no burden. There's no tears. There's nothing there. And so you come into that environment, and my friend, you're suffocated. You can't pray. You can't cry. You can't, because the prayer around you is killing you. So that's why revivals rarely happen in churches. Rarely. They do in some, but it's rare. Where do they happen? Outside the church. People meet as they did in Kells in 1857 and 8, when Jeremiah, uh, thinking of his name, Lamphere, as they met for prayer and called on the Lord. My friends, the right people came. Not within the context of church, but just people with a burden. I encourage you to meet with people who have a burden in your home, wherever you can. Get them to come and meet for prayer. We're going to pray for revival. And don't, don't be all about buns and cakes and teas and all that. That can have its place. But you're there for a purpose, and the purpose is revival. We have a prayer meeting in our home. It has gone on for several years now. And that's the focus. We have a coffee table in the center of the living room and on it. There's some people here tonight. They're only too familiar with it. There's a coffee table and there's a map of the island of Ireland on it. And we gather around at times. We hold hands around it and we pray and we cry and we weep and we call on God. God, we want this nation turned back to you. My dear friend, you could do that in your home. You could do that in your home. Many places today, churches wouldn't permit it. The minister wouldn't allow it. He hasn't even the burden or vision for it. He's the one that needs revived. So you can't let the world go to hell waiting on a clergyman. You have to go yourself and wait on God, just as they did in those days. Lay people. They met before God and called on God, and God heard them. Prayer defined, seek God's face. Well, what happens very briefly in prayer? Well, my friends, let me explain to you what, what God answer, answering prayer is like. 
What happens is when we get out of the way, when our will, when we humble ourselves and get rid of our plans and abandon it and put it, put it all in the bin, then we come to God and we wait on God and let God begin to speak to us and God's Spirit begin to fill us. And what happens is that God has conceived a plan in his heart. That's where it starts. That's where prayer starts. Not with you. It starts with him. It's conceived in his heart. He is something he wants to do on earth. He conceives it in his own being. Then he reveals it supernaturally to that person, to those people who are waiting before him. As they wait in prayer before him, God reveals it supernaturally to the yielded hearts of the believers. And they get a sense. Sometimes it's very powerful revelation. Sometimes it's just a word from God, a verse from the Bible. God gives a word. And so they have heard from God. They have got something from the Almighty. It's not the pulpit. It's not the denomination. It's not the preacher. God has spoken to us. God has said this is what he wants to do. And so we take God's promise. And then we pray. We begin to plead that promise before God. That's what happened in the Isle of Lewis. Whenever those ministers said uh, to the people, we've got, the, there's divine displeasure, what happened was the two old ladies, there's two ladies in particular that are noted in the revival. One was blind and the other was lame. 84, 86, something like that. And the two old ladies took it to heart. They were praying women. And what they did was they took the promise, I will pour water on him that is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. And they never let that promise go. They said, God, you keep your word. We are going to plead. We are thirsty. You're going to increase our thirst. We're going to get hungrier and hungrier under the Holy Spirit as he gives us the hunger. We're going to plead. We're going to pray. And they kept praying. And then the burden transferred to others and then others. And they began to get the burden. And they all were pleading the promise of God. Do you know what happened eventually? Those two old ladies... One blind, one lame in their 80s. They're so in tune with God by this time. They're so walking with God. They're in such fellowship with the Holy Spirit that they begin to hear the spirit world, that world that's out there, you know, that we know so little or nothing about. They begin to hear that world. And they begin to hear the powers of darkness, the demons, the principalities that are over the island destroying the people. They begin to hear them cry, retreat. <laughs> Retreat. The devil's crying, retreat. Praying's breaking his power. Praying's breaking his kingdom. Praying's destroying his principalities. The grip he has on the land is coming off because prayer won't be uh, yielded to. It has to be yielded to by, by the devil when it's in the Holy Ghost because this is God's plan. This wasn't started. These people are praying God's plan. And you know what happens, my dear friends? A young man gets up in the prayer meeting along with seven others in a house. And he gets up in the prayer meeting and they're praying and he said, Men, if our hearts are not rightly related to God, and if our hands are not clean before God, then there's no point in us praying for revival. Because God says in his word, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. And Duncan Campbell shared later on, he said that in that meeting, that young man held his hands up before God. They were meeting, I think, three or four times a week, these men, after a hard day's work, praying just for revival, pleading the same promise, getting right with God, getting their homes sorted out, getting everything cleaned out, getting sin dealt with. And what they did was they pleaded with God and he said, God, are my hands clean? Is my heart pure? And Duncan Campbell said when he prayed that, he fell into a trance, collapsed on the floor under the power of the Holy Spirit. And Campbell said that there was a power unleashed from heaven that shook the Hebrides. Revival. Revival. My dear friend, seeking his face. Well, let's draw toward a close. Seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Ah, my dear friends, 
seeking his face. All the areas of dishonesty and cheating and stealing, unforgiveness and bitterness and lust, and a tongue out of control. Myriads of things that God the Holy Spirit will put his finger on. And if you're willing to deal with that, and abstain from all appearance of evil. I remember many years ago, I was in a prayer meeting in the lifeboat. It could have been 27, 28 years ago. Our brother Pat Kitchen was at the prayer meeting. I think we met every Tuesday for a number of years, Bertie and a few others. Brilliant prayer meeting. And I can remember one day I had been in the shop, a little shop opposite where I lived, and uh, in the shop there was little buns, and I went over every morning at 10 o'clock. It was kind of like my little fix. I got this bun every morning at 10 o'clock. Beautiful little buns. But when I was praying, I was saying in the prayer meeting, I said, Lord, because we needed to be right with God. And I said, Lord, you know, whenever I go over to the shop, there's these old magazines. And Lord, you know the images sometimes. And I was trying to talk to God all about this. And Pat Kitchen was lying on his belly on the floor. And he just shouted out while I was praying, stay out of the shop. That brought the prayer to a quick, abrupt end. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Stay out of the shop. Don't play with sin. Don't think you can handle it. It'll handle you. He says, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, then I will hear from heaven. God says, I, you'll get my ear. Isn't that what we need? God says, you'll get my ear now. If you fulfill those conditions, God says, you'll be guaranteed when you pray, you'll have my ear. And it's a wonderful thing when you have the ear of God, my friend. And you can know that you have the ear of God. Whenever you pray in the Holy Ghost and you have others praying in the Holy Ghost in a prayer meeting and they pray and their prayers are sent to God, what will happen is that you can pray and cry to God and then suddenly the presence of God, the power of God will descend and God may bring it to complete silence and it is God coming down and saying, I have heard you. Oh yes, my friend, you can get the ear of God. You can get the ear of God. He said, I will hear from heaven. He said, I'll forgive. He said, I'll blot out all your sins. I'll make you clean. And he said, I'll heal. I'll heal your land. I'll do all that because you can't do it. I can listen. I can forgive. And I can heal. Do you remember the story we told you at the start of the man in South Africa, or South America, rather? And he told us about the island, this, this, this land in South America, and, and the region had just literally gone to the devil. A missionary came along, and one person got converted. Well, thank God they'd never been to Northern Ireland. That's all I say. I remember telling them that. Thank God they'd never been to Northern Ireland. Because they didn't have we prayer meetings and hours and flipping banging hymn books after an hour to say it's over. They didn't have all that going on. They prayed. They prayed. They, the missionary taught them. He said, listen, if you want God to come, you'll have to pray. You might have to fast. But if you get right with God and you live right before God and you read his word and study his word and live for him and make that the priority of your life, they took it to heart, my friend. They began to pray. They prayed all the time. No wee half hour or we midweek. None of that. Thank God. And they were praying. And what happened was God began to move in a home that was beside them and they all got converted. They told them the same. Well, thank God they hadn't had Northern Ireland to educate them. They were free from that. 
All they knew was that we need to pray. We need to read the Bible. We need to trust God. God will come. He has come into our hearts. We love him. We must follow him. We just give everything to him. And so they do. And then another gets saved. And another. And the whole community was moved by the power of the Holy Spirit. And they were all praying that God would have mercy on them. That God would come to their island, their district. That God would come to their city and their region. And they kept praying and praying and praying. And trusting and believing. And one day he told us, they walked down to the shore, a number of them walked down to the shore where the fish used to be. And as they're walking down to the shore, they can't believe their eyes. There's a fire, a fire burning on the ocean. It's about at least 30, 40, 50 foot high, and it goes on for quite a distance down. Loads of people come down to see it. They're watching it. There's fire burning out in the ocean, up into the sky. They notice that the water begins to bubble. The water's bubbling and bubbling and bubbling. And they say, is the water going on fire? Suddenly, the fire goes away. But the bubbling continues. He said, do you know what happened? All the fish came back. They all came back. The animals began to come back. The land began to become re- productive. Great vegetables began to go. That became a blessed, healed area. Not just men's souls, but friends, their livelihoods, everything. God came. That's revival. That's revival. I will heal your land. I know that not everybody tonight will perhaps take on board everything, or I know that. If the law of averages or anything to go by. But there's got to be some here tonight. Some of you young people. What are you going to do with that life of yours? Who are you going to give it to? God wants your life. God wants you. My friend, don't miss it. Don't miss following God. Don't miss loving God. Don't miss giving everything to God. Some of you middle-aged people, it's not too late. It's not too late. Look at the two old ladies in Lewis. It's never too late. God, deal with me. God, work in me. Holy Spirit, take control of me. Let that spring come up. Remove all the concrete. And begin to pray. Begin to pray. 